Big Buck Registries, Big Buck Podcast, episode number 60. Scott Sciarra with Game Changer TV and Primal Instinct. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. Hi, this is Sean Lepko with Heartland Bow Hunter. Hey, this is Michael Huntucker with Heartland Bow Hunter. And you're listening to my favorite podcast on iTunes. The Big, Big Buck, Buck Registry's Big, Big Buck, Buck Podcast. podcast. This is Jim Coger with TrophyPursuit.com, and you're listening to Big Buck Registries, Big Buck Podcast. I'm Lee Lukowski. And I'm Tiffany Lukowski, and you're listening to our favorite hunting podcast on iTunes. The Big Buck Registries, Big Buck Podcast. Welcome to the show. This is Jay Scott, your host of the Big Buck Registries, Big Buck Podcast. I'd like to welcome you to another episode, and I'd like to welcome my good friend and field correspondent from Ohio, Dusty Phillips, back to the show to uh, do it again. What's up, Dusty? You know how the weather's getting greater and greater for whitetail season to come upon us? I've been out in the woods, and it's like I'm a new person. That's awesome. What about you, Jay? What's happening with you in New Hampshire? It's Man, it's starting to smell a lot like deer season, and I got the real itches the other day to be outside and actually go hunting, and it's, it's teasing me. Um, but it won't be long. It won't be long at all, and we'll all be out there doing our thing. Uh, absolutely. You know, I, I put out some mineral Got my covert trail camera out. Very cool. And we're going to see what happens. All right. Tell me a little bit about how you put out your mineral because I, I have a bag here. I haven't done it yet, um, but I, I want to know kind of what you do. Actually, I, I packed it all in a backpack. Here's what I did. I took a gallon of water, mm-hmm. took, took my bag of mineral, and I took a 8-inch garden shovel with me, headed to the woods, yep. cleared a spot about 20, 25 yards from my stand. Okay. I cleared it off down the bare dirt. Got my little shovel out, dug it up three to five inches, just turned it over. Okay. Sprinkled half the mineral bag onto the area that I turned over. Yep. Then I took and dumped the gallon of water on top. Okay. Then I stirred it back up. Well, I dumped half the gallon, then I stirred it, stirred the dirt and the mineral all together. Yep. Got it all blended together, and then I dumped the other half of the gallon of water on top of it. Okay. Let it ride. And you still have the other half of the mineral to go? Correct. Okay. Yes. So you yep. saved you just half a bag. Yes. Gotcha. And half a bag, and I'm a uh, two weeks maybe. See how how they do on it. I'm, you know, kind of trial and error. See what happens. You know, obviously you can put out the whole bag. But I thought I thought if I can power freshen it up a little bit in a couple of weeks, then it'll be just that much better. Gotcha. And then the deer will come and like lick the dirt. Is that the idea? Yeah, they'll eat the dirt. They'll eat everything. They'll eat the dirt. Interesting. Make a hole. That's funny. Yeah, infraction. Deer, deer are funny creatures. I, I've never really used mineral before. I've had like salt licks or a big block, but I've never applied mineral like that. That's kind of cool. Yeah, it should. Uh, you know, once they get on it, you know, you need to do it soon. Get on it. Get All it right. out. Have you had luck uh, with this technique in the past? Yeah, absolutely. It, it'll definitely, you know, increase your, it, it's like it gives it the punch to the rack that it needs to put the inches on. Really? So it actually affects the 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 actual deer itself not just yeah it's not not yeah not only antler but you know mineral helps out for a healthy herd okay it, you know it's going to give them the minerals to make it through the winter so this is like the last step to like polish the the horns in a sense yeah in a sense uh you can you can put it out throughout the the whole summer i mean you, you can put mineral all year if you if you like you know oh, okay. snow, snow is obviously good to, to get it in the ground gotcha and uh you know they'll they'll use it year round if you got it out there for them awesome okay all right well i'm gonna follow your instructions and i will get that out this weekend well, that's cool um Got a cool show today. We're kind of carrying on with our theme of television shows and, and how to put those together and kind of talking to those that are successful doing it. We got Scott Sciarra from Game Changer TV and Primal Instinct. You know, we're pumped up to have Scott on, and I think we're going to learn a few things again tonight. That You know, we always learn something, but uh, as we get into season, you know, this is kind of our, our practice rounds as if we're playing a football game we got to practice before we go to the woods so you know all these episodes on tv shows 
may help take your hunting and video and editing to the next level. Yeah, I always learn uh, something from these guys. Well, if they're professional hunters, you, they're doing something that I'm not doing, that's for sure. Uh, so it's nice to just hear what they're doing. And if you're in the TV realm idea, like if you want to take what you do into the television scene, probably get some pointers on that too. So um, let's, uh, let's get Scott on the air. Right, let's do it. Scott Shero, welcome to the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate being here tonight. Oh, it's an honor to have you. We love talking to hunters and hunters that are on TV and are showing off their skill set, and uh, you fit that category. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, I love to do it, and I've been doing it since I was a little kid, like probably a lot of us. And growing up in the suburbs of Philadelphia, there's not a ton of bow hunters, but my dad being into it kind of... Uh, drug me into it and I just had an addiction since I was uh you know since the first time I put a bow on my hand mostly bow hunting is my uh is my is my love for sure that's awesome so you grew up in Philadelphia just in the suburbs of Philadelphia and uh we actually grew up here and we're starting to starting to get a little bit out in the TV show we actually sit and show how we did it growing up a little bit different than most people sitting in backyards and shooting a bunch of does just to get permission yeah and in those places where you weren't allowed to hunt and you're only were allowed to bow hunt we actually grew up and killed some really good deer as kids, and and it's a shame now a lot of those deer that were there and now they've had sharpshooters come in and and have called all the areas that had a lot of you know really good hunting for us and instead of letting us do it the, the deer hunting and bow hunting which is an effective way they had you know sharpshooters come in and spend taxpayers money and, and pretty much decimate them so it's not like it used to be around here for sure and disappointing but. You know, and that led us a lot of people around here to, to venture out of state to other places. God, I, I will never in, in my entire life understand why they do that. I mean, I, I understand. I know I don't understand. I'll never get the argument, but I know they do it, and it frustrates me to no end when I hear about stuff like that. Nah. Well, we did that in, like, when I was younger, we started, like, deer hunting clubs, and we would hunt and get permission with insurance and sit backyards and we did some nature centers and with like five or six good bow hunters, we shot like 130 does in a season, you know, maintained the, you know, the habitat, the, you know, the, the browse level started to come back again. And we did it for the love of the sport. All the deer got donated to fill abundance. Every deer got aged and a jawbone got pulled to say, you know, a two and a half year old doe should weigh 80 pounds and it only weighs 60. You know, it was very, you know, it was done as it worked and it was effective. And then you have a, the biggest park probably in the country in Fairmount Park, which was right next to this nature center. And, you know, you have them spending hundreds of thousand dollars on a sharpshooter coming in and, and taking them out with a group of, you know, proficient bow hunters. You know, you could have, you know, saved taxpayers a lot of money and had people that actually wanted to do it, appreciate it, rather than some guy with a light at night shooting them in the side of the head with a, you know, a two twenty two. So, right. Just awful. Far, but, just not the way to yeah, do it, it, man. Just not the way. And it's crazy. They, they even worse. They do it in February when all the deer are shed, and even if the ones that are left, they don't care if they're bucks or does. They're killing our big, you know, our big shed bucks. You know, a part of that. At least they did it. And they were just shooting does, which is the what we would do. They were killing the killing kill one buck here in Pennsylvania, and they have unlimited doe tags in certain areas, and. It's just, uh, you know, heartbreaking for sure, you know, especially if you, no matter who you are, if you love the sport, you hate to see it happen. Right. So how old were you when, when you're, they put the first bow in your hand? Um, I would say 12 or 13 years old. Um, I started out, you know, earlier gun hunting with my dad and, yeah. you know, they'd take you back to the, we would go to the mountains of Pennsylvania and, uh, you know, you couldn't wait for opening morning. You know, and the only time you would go, and you, you know, 11 and 12, and just went the first year to watch, and then the next year to actually go up there and, you know, shoot a deer, and, and then just kind of evolved, evolved from that. And then when I got into mine, about 14, I started working in bow shops, and by the time I was 18, I was just about guiding all over the world. Um, you know, it started, you know, British Columbia, and worked my way down to Montana and Colorado, and back through the Midwest, and even through college, I took spring and summer classes, and it was pretty much gone the whole the whole fall just hunting for tips you know you hunting with people for tips so sure uh, you know. that's kind of a accelerated learning curve scott yeah i mean but it, it gave me appreciation for other places across the country what sure. hunting's like i mean i love one of the things that we love about tv it's not really it's every place you go and even on a conversation like tonight you get to meet new people and everywhere you go you start out as a you know you make new friends you know in different places in the world people hunt different it's they do things different, and everybody gets to the same conclusion when they harvest an animal, whether it's a four-pointer or a 200-inch deer. 
you know, it's just nice to meet people and see how they do it and, yep. and make friends in all different places, I think, is what makes it the, uh, you know, makes, makes it so special to us. Gotcha. Uh, do you, uh, you, you hunted all through school, high school. So you, you started hunting when you were, or bow hunting when you were 14, but before that, you were gun hunting with your dad. Um, what was your dad like? My dad was in the music business, actually. And, uh, you know, was a city boy that got into it through someone in his family, passed it down. Hmm. And he passed it on to me and still, you know, he's more of a gun hunter, all about going out and just, you know, he wants to kill something where I'm all about, you know, I love the challenge of finding, uh, you know, a trophy deer, one particular deer, two particular deer and, and fine tuning in on them. You know, and that's my season. You know what I mean? If I kill him, I kill him. If I don't, I don't. And if I want meat, I'll shoot those. So that's kind of how I, and working for outfitters in different places across the country, you know, I got to realize that not all of these outfitters are the best people and run their businesses the way. So it actually scared me from wanting the wrong guy to hunt, which then took me and a couple of my really good friends in our early 20s and decided to go to Kansas when they first went over the counter and got our own property. And then ever since then, I've just been leasing land all across, you know, the Midwest with, you know, a good group of friends and good group of hunters with the same idea and, you know, now we've gotten to the point where we just go out and whether we kill something or not, we just enjoy being out together and having fun. I think right. that right. as you get older, it's not always about the, the size of the deer. I think it's more, you, our slogan is just more than just the hunt. And I think it's, you know, it's more about appreciating the, you know, the time you have out there in the field as you get older. Definitely. No question about that. Um, I can appreciate that. I'm, I'm 43 and I get it now. I really understand that whole aspect. Um, yeah, I, I don't know do if I, youth, yeah. And we do a youth military hunt every year in, in Kentucky with the QDMA and Cabela's with a bunch of kids that either their parents are away in military or their parents were, they never, till this year, I had two hunters that lost their father, four hunters actually lost their parents at battle. And that was like, you know, you take it for granted. Um, you know, we took them out and they all killed deer. And I remember we were like four grown men sitting there on a doe hunt. I remember the first year we did it, I was kind of selfish. And I'm like, I don't want to leave. Kentucky, I want to hunt more. I'll meet you guys over there. And now after three years of doing it, probably my favorite hunt I do. And to see these kids, you know, that you touch. I left there, you know, grown men are crying when this kid shoots a doe. And, you know, six, <laughs> eight months later, you know, after these kids are over, we stay in touch. We text all the time. You know, what really touched me, you don't realize it, but he actually, two kids text me on Father's Day. And I was like, oh, my God, that's really like wow. what made him. I don't want him to text me on Father's Day, you know, of all days. And, it's, you know, you don't realize, I guess, when you take a kid that's never done it, you know, or they're going to see themselves on TV. You don't realize how you can affect someone's life and change their life by doing that. But that was just, I think, out of all the hunting experience I did to have that, you know, have that happen, you know, because I'm always always like, I need to kill a big deer. I need to shoot the 160 and. You know, and I think it puts it in perspective, you know, yeah. how important it is sometimes just to help get other people into our sport. You know, there's not enough young people doing it. Right. It kind of humbles the everything and really um, it zones in on our humanity when it comes down to it. Uh, no doubt, for sure, 100%. Yeah. That's, that's the real human aspect right there. It's definitely an awesome thing that you're doing for them young kids. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, it's just every year it gets bigger and bigger. It got awarded the quality deer management you know, hunt of the year, which I think is a big honor for all the different branches, you know, across the whole country. You know, the, the organization's amazing, you know, and to have that be elected at their, you know, national banquet to be the hunt of the year was, you know, truly an honor. And people like Biologic and Brownstone and seen other people that were there, you know, the way they gave up their farms and properties and let these kids come in and, you know, it's pretty awesome to see how people, you know, you like to see that shown on TV instead of the negative stuff, you know, how people... And those shows don't always get the best ratings, and I don't think you can actually really appreciate it unless you're actually there or have a really ridiculously good, you know, camera crew that can catch, capture the true emotion. Yeah, it's absolutely. Like, it's right. really, really, really an awesome right. experience. That's right. It's, a, it's emotional for you and for the kids, you know, and, and you by saying that you got a couple messages on Father's Day, you know, that, that's really cool. Yeah, no, it was, I was sitting there, my wife, well, I'm like, you know, a grown man. <laughs> my wife was sitting on the couch, and I have a daughter, and I was just sitting there, and my eyes are welling up, and I'm like, this is crazy. Right. You know, so why did he have to text me today? You know what I mean? On Father's Day. You know, which was, I took it, you know, as a compliment, but, you know, it puts it in perspective when your kid wants something at the store, <laughs> and they, you know, you think these kids are, you know, never going to see their parents again, so. Right. Yeah, right, you know, it just, it, it, it's realism. It, it It's something that, um, you know, it, it makes you a better person for doing that. So for all the people out there, it's not just always about honey. It's about the experience. And that's the perfect example of where, 
you know, it's about the experience of these kids, you know what I mean, where they, they take it to a whole nother level for, you know, I think for the kid and for the hunter. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. You know, it's something to be honored about. Yep. Sure. Scott, what were you like in high school? Did you, uh, were you popular? Did you hang out in a clique? Yeah, I mean, I thought, I mean, I thought I was. I mean, <laughs> I played a lot of sports, you know, I mean, I was very active in sports. Yeah. I played baseball, basketball, and, um, you know, but I pretty much got to the point where literally I didn't want to be anywhere after school. In the fall, I would drop my books, come home, and I wanted to be in a tree. You know, I always wanted to make my parents drop me off, get a ride. Like, I always wanted to be in a tree or in the woods. Bow hunting was always my thing. As soon as, that, as, soon as the leaves start to change, I change to a different person. That's where I want to be. Right. Gotcha. And what what did you do after high school? Did you end up going to college, military? What would you do? I went, to, I went to college. I went to Temple. Like I said, I went to Temple University in Philly, yeah. and I would take spring and summer classes and then be uh, be off in the woods for the whole fall. And then, uh, you know, my dad would say, I can't believe you're going to go away to make, you know, a couple thousand dollars for tips, but it's just, it's in me. I mean, when you love it, you love it. And I feel like every day you never know, you know, what tomorrow is going to bring and you got to live for live for today and, you know, go hunting and, you know, now I'm even getting to the point I need to take my dad hunting more. You get to that point where you're getting older and you feel how much, how many more times are we going to get to do, you know, do stuff together. So I appreciate that more, but you know, I real deep down inside, I just love the chase. I love the whole bow hunting experience of, you know, having to figure them out, having to be, you know, which was 10, 20 yards. Now maybe it's 40 yards. Um, but I just love that whole, the puzzle, put the puzzle together with trail cameras and food plots. And my wife will say, how can I, how can you describe my my husband at home? And she'll say he will drive six hours to plant a food plot that looks perfect, but he won't put a piece of grass seed down in his own backyard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's awesome. And I think that, that pretty so much true. defines me for sure. But yep. you know, but I do put grass seed down in the backyard. So, so what's your wife like? I mean, does she tolerate this stuff? She believe in it? What's she, she, you know what? She knows how much I love it. And, you know, I think she, she can, she sees that when I'm home, I think I'm the world's best dad and husband. You know, I gotta, right. you gotta balance it, but between having a normal job and, and then being in the TV industry and then trying to be a dad and a husband, you know, it's a lot of balancing, you know, and I feel like, you know, when you are home, I need to, you know, pay attention to your family, do things with your family, because that's important to me, you know, and when I'm gone for four or five or six days, you know, I'm sure as soon as you pull out of the driveway, you miss them, but they know you're there for, because I love it, and it's not because I want to be away from them. I think that's, you know, that's important, you know, most important. It's because, you know, we love to do it, and I think that there's definitely, definitely the same. And she's going to heaven for putting up with my hunt habits, for sure. Right. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> you married a good woman Inter- there. Interesting. Yep. Yeah, um, this is great. Scott, if I could, I'd like to kind of just turn the mic over to Dusty for a little bit and have him run down your setups, your pl- your food plot setups, uh, your gear, uh, maybe run through maybe your most memorable hunt. Um, I'm going to have Dusty kind of walk us through that, if that's all right. That'd be great. Cool. And are you guys, uh, we'll get into the food plots a little bit. Tell us a little bit about what you do uh, and, and kind of like the general area. Are you here's playing, a, are you doing? Here's a, egg- what we do is we try to secure, uh, you know, a big piece of property. Um, you know, whether it's 400 acres, sometimes it hunts big, it's 200 acres up to 1,000 acres, sometimes even more. And we will try to, you know, plant we have beans and corn on most of our places so they're working for farms so we'll try to plant stuff that's green when all that stuff's brown um which i think is important for just for nutritional plots clover big clover plots and then when we do our hunting plots we try to plant them as close as we can to their bedding areas um so they can get there before dark put them in places where they feel comfortable i think we're very 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 uh crucial about how we get to our stands how we get in it. I sit, I think I just got a new league somewhere in Kentucky. I think I yelled at because I think I sat and stared at an 800 acre map for about two days straight, thinking how I can before I even walked it. I think I'm very, very, uh, strategically like to think it out, not never take the fun out of it. I think that's important. Um, but we like to plant those food plots as close as we can to where they bed. So if they get up and they do make it before dark, I mean, the rut's a whole different ball game, but for early in the season, later in the season, you know, we want them to get there before it's dark so we can have, for us, the camera light for filming is a huge thing. You know, I've had times when I've had, you know, I've had 160 inch, 170 inch deer that I can shoot with my bow, but I can't shoot because the camera can't see them, which I think is probably the thing I don't like most about the whole filming aspect. Because right. maybe you're, there's times where I've hunted a deer for three, four years and you finally get that opportunity. And because the camera now is in the tree and it's either two of you will blow it because they see you. Or now it blows it because, you know, it's too dark. It's definitely another obstacle that, you know, 
we face, we need them to get there. So I think not pressuring them and letting them feel comfortable coming into that food plot is huge. And, I, and the use of email cameras is crucial because now I can be in Pennsylvania and watch what's coming in my food plot, you know, which my, my wife thinks is cheating. Um, watch what's coming in my food plot from home. You know what I mean? That's huge. I know when to go. I know when they're moving. I know what time they're walking out. I know if they're there in the morning or there at night, you know. Within reason, I think that's a huge part um, of our success is the email. Not just a trail camera, but an email trail camera that actually works, which we use through SpyPoint. And uh, they've just been amazing. They've just been probably the most crucial tool for us being successful hunting the food plots. Right on. When, when you guys put a food plot out, what's your kind of steps of getting that food plot out to make the most tonnage? Uh, you guys do soil samples. Run us through kind of your yearly routine. Soil samples always, a lot of ours because they've been done before. I mean, we kind of, you know, we're spoiled the first time we do them. We always do a soil sample. Um, we always do a really, really, you know, bang up job of making sure we round them up really good, making sure everything's dead. I don't do a lot with spring and summer plots because I feel like if it's not where I can visit it a lot or it's close enough to home, I really can't beat the weeds. Right. You know, so I feel like I concentrate more on the fall plots. And I have some clover plots, you know, that I do want, but I just can't. The problem not being close to home, fighting the weeds on the spring and summer plots have always been, been an issue unless I've actually had them for a few years where I've got them under control. But that's always seems to be, I waste a lot of money on seed, you know, before I had sponsors, you know, helping me out with that, that, you know, taught me a lot. It was like a trial and error in the beginning. I'm sure everybody's went out and put, bought a $50 bag of seed, put it in the ground and wonder why it didn't grow, you know. So just right, took absolutely. a lot of trial and error. What kind of, what kind of seed are you planting? It's like last year, we had huge bean fields. Um, we planted some evolved mean bean, which is, uh, you know, it's good early because it stays green. But the problem is, if you have high numbers of deer and you don't plant a big enough plot, you can just get destroyed and never make it out of the ground or keep them out. So when we planted them, I have great success with Biologic Maxim. I have two plots in that that literally... I mean, the, our pictures of our food plots have been all over their catalog because, I, like, like my wife says, it'll drive six hours. We've used some uh, fertilizer and lime mixtures on those. It just from a company called SoCal. It just makes them explode. I had them be, you know, knee high one year, the same conditions, and put that fertilizer on them the next year. They're waist high, um, you know, which is just, you know, it's, it's something about planting that food plot. And just watching those deer come out and eating it is, is for me is just it's enjoyable. That's almost the whole preparation of doing it, building the plot, watching them come in it, and the whole preparation, hanging a stand, the whole puzzle. I think I enjoy that as much as I do the actual hunt part. Right, very rewarding. Food plots seem to be oh, very, no doubt. very rewarding. Yeah. When you talk trail cameras, you're using a email system. The the trail camera sends out the picture or to the picture to your email. Tell us a little bit more about that and what you're using there. Well, it started out with a company called Smart Scatter. It was like the original company that developed that technology. Um, and everybody would complain the picture quality wasn't so good. And I always looked at it and said, I don't care about the picture quality. I care about the deer. I know when they're coming. And then it evolved. I mean, and, you know, companies have made it better. This company, Five Point, that now sponsors us. And I, w- I never like to, excuse my lines, or prostitute myself for a product. I like to go with companies that I would be using if I wasn't doing a TV show for the most part. And they make a camera that sends a picture when something, you know, you can set it from home, whether it walks by it from, uh, whether it sends me an email that says you have a new picture, I can have it send it instantly. So if you walk by my camera right now, you get a picture in probably 30 seconds, or I can have it send pictures once or twice a day. So what I'll do is I'll, when I'm not there, I'll put it on uploading maybe once or twice a day. Um, and I can set the time in between the pictures, depending upon if it's on a trail, on a food plot, I'll set that time different. But the nice thing is, is when I get there, or I go anywhere, if I bring two and get cell reception, when I put that on auto and they send pictures automatically, I'm hunting in two places. So I can put that in a, when I get to a new farm and I, you know, I want to know if they're really cruising, I'll put it in the funnel. I'll put it on a creek crossing. I'll put it on spots and I'll know when those deer, you know, are there and how many times, you know, did I get down and go to Bob Evans at 930 you know, I have a big buck. Well, I should have stayed in the tree, and I hate the camera because I get it. I'm sitting in breakfast, and here comes a nice deer right by my tree at 11 o'clock. <laughs> and I'm, you know, in right. town. So, 
it, you know, I think some people feel like it's not. I love it. I mean, I literally, my wife looks at me in the middle of the night and she'll say, I can't believe you just looked at your phone. Good. I'll go sleep in the spare bedroom because now she knows I'm looking at pictures and, you know, and that's most, <laughs> it's mostly in, you know, October, November. Um, but they're very, very, very addicting and now they're affordable. I mean, they were five, six hundred dollar cameras that are now, you know, two ninety nine with no monthly charge to kind of pay as you go. So it's not really breaking the bank and you're getting the, you know, the technology. And here where I live, a lot of hunters, small area close to the city, they can be stolen. So my fear in the beginning was, I don't want to use them here. Now they make them with, you know, a dime battery in it that someone steals it. For two days, it'll it'll have a GPS in it. And it'll, like, if you stole it, I can come find it and I would know it's in your bedroom. Like, I can tell what part of the house it's in. So it's pretty, uh, pretty awesome technology. Right. I'm, I'm going to ask you a question. Did I hear you right? You said that you go to the spare bedroom to check your deer pictures. I get thrown out for checking them in the middle of the night. <laughs> so I get thrown out of my bedroom and get sent to the spare bedroom for the rest of the night. Cause I, you know, once I start looking at them, I usually don't fall back to sleep and I toss and turn thinking about it. And I get sent down to the spare bedroom by my wife. <laughs> <laughs> That's an addiction. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's a problem. Well, I, I thought That's I heard problem. that right, but I wanted to clarify that. What, what kind of tree stands are you guys using there? You and hang ons? You, you doing ladders? You, you... Usually a two man setup would be Millennium, Smooth Millenniums, really big, comfortable seat, easy to hang, it's safe. Bracket stays up in the tree, stand with a big seat gets dropped into a bracket. And for me, it makes me sit longer. That's most important. You know, if I'm in a tree stand, it's uncomfortable. I don't feel comfortable in them up and down. Cameraman doesn't use it. He has a smaller stand behind just because of the tree arms. He can't sit in that one or, um, you know, it's a bigger seat. But that M100, now they have an M150. is just the most comfortable stand and light and easy to hang we've ever used. We try to use them as much as possible. Uh, we have some M50s. So usually it's a, it's a stick ladder, screw-ins. You know, I don't want to be in a tree because the tree stand, you know, because it fits a ladder. I want to be in the tree because it's the right tree. Um, so I feel like the hang-ons... Um, give us the most flexibility to be in the right tree, not the tree that we have to be in. Because I've done that so many times, you know, where you just say, oh, okay, here it's a straighter tree, or that's easier, you know, and taking the shortcut, and the shortcut usually doesn't, doesn't usually we go with your instincts. It's, right, uh, absolutely. It's yeah. be where you want to be, I think. So everybody's yeah. done that. They understand and look across the tree they wanted to be in and watch the deer walk by that tree, or, you know. So. Right on. And hang on, seem to be more versatile. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm not against the ladder, but I just, you know, it's heavy. They're bigger. I just feel like I'd rather have 50 hang-ons to every one, one ladder. If I'm taking my dad out or somebody older, I'd be more than happy to, you know. And they get mad at me because I put the steps too far apart. And they think I want to kill you. <laughs> so ladders for them is easier. But for us, you know, diehard ones being, and we got to meet move all the time. You know, it depending upon, you know, I'll get down and see something two days in a row. I won't watch it for the third day in a row. I'll be on that tree. You know, we'll get down it before we leave to go out and eat breakfast, move the set and get out of there. So right on. Yeah, absolutely. You know, go to where you see the activity. What, uh, yep. what kind of, cam- what kind of camo are you guys wear? Um, right now, right now we're working with, we've been working with Sandbox for a couple of years. We were with Cryptic before that. Um, I always like a lighter, more open pattern for the Midwest. I don't like the darker, you know, like the original breakup and some of those original mossy oak patterns were darker. And even the original real trees, you just, you get those wide open trees with two people in them, you look like a big black blob sitting up in there. I'm very into the, you know, more open, wider, lighter, like the mossy oak tree stands, the real tree extras, you know, the more diverse open patterns is always what we've, we've, you know, used. We're not putting a lot in the south or more Midwest and, you know, northeast in Pennsylvania here in the hardwoods. So is what we've always tried to, to right stick on. with. Absolutely. So we covered. I, mean, I started you. out wearing. I started out wearing eight sat. If you guys remember that, that was an older, an older, just browns and blacks lines going through it. And you know, no one ever liked that from two feet away. But you know, back up in three seven yards away, and he disappeared. So right, yeah, it's you know, it's all about blending in for sure. Yep. It, tell us about one of your most memorable hunts. Kind of give us a rundown of of how your day started, the weather conditions. Can you can you remember the particular day and and what the weather and everything was like? Yeah, I, ha- I had a deer. My biggest deer I killed was an Ohio buck that we called Split Times. He was uh, he was our first. We started on the lease, and we had a lot of bucks, 120 to 140. And it was 800-acre lease that we had. It was pushed to 1,000 after that year. Um, and another piece to it. And this is our first, like, 150-plus deer and, uh, that we had on our farm that we felt like we grew. And we knew the potential of the place if we can 
you know, just keep keep letting them go, letting them go, letting them go, and laying off, which is hard. You know, you get a guy, a buddy that's never been in the Midwest, and he sees a 130 or 140, it's hard for him to pass it up, and he understood that. But this deer in particular got shot, and we were afraid he wouldn't make it. My buddy Dave had hit him, and we were scared he wouldn't make it. And I got a picture of him the next summer, and he was just, I mean, he was so big, I didn't know what, if I even wanted to tell anybody, but I told everybody I couldn't hold back and show everybody the pictures. And I hunted him for about a solid two weeks. And then with the email cameras, I came home, and again, my wife saw me looking at the pictures. I was getting pictures of them in three different scrapes, because they have a synthetic scrape that they hit in the summer, winter. They hit, I read the buck on the property, eventually we'll visit the scrape, and we kind of call it a buck trap. And once the buck comes into that scrape, during daylight hours, the trap is set, so you know he feels comfortable coming to that spot. So he was hitting three different, and I'm pretty much doing a loop. And when I went out there the next time, I got out of the tree because I was freezing at 9.15. And after I sat in the truck, my fingers were, the engine was running, I could see the tree stand on the hillside. He walked out of my tree at 10 yards before the attempt. And I was yeah. sick to my stomach. Oh, and I man. came home, I came home, and I remember two days after I was home, my wife said to me, you're miserable, just go back and try to shoot that deer. Well, I went back and I brought my dad with me. And uh, that day afternoon, in the morning, I didn't see much, and after it started snowing, and it was the first day of gun season. I was bow hunting. And uh, the neighbors, he came out in the field with another buck way before dark, but he was too far. And one of the neighbors shot a shotgun, a muzzleloader a shotgun on opening day, and it wasn't even close. And when that gunshot went off, he ran right to me like it was he was meant to be and put a shot on him, and he ran over and died. So having that long quest, going back and forth, all the pictures, sheds, and then to top it all off with my dad being there with me, which usually wouldn't be there with me, you know, just made it that much more special. So. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, think, I don't think it matters about the size of the hunt. You know, everyone, what's nice about it is you guys as hunters and everybody out there knows that every time you get to, you know, whether it's in your office or your home, you get to look up on the wall and look at that mount. You get to look back and remember that hunt. And I think that's what makes it so, makes it so great about having them on your wall. But now if, these cameras and still pictures and video, you know, with us, we get to watch it over and over again, which I think is, I love, I love that part, to be able to experience it again. But, you know, sometimes it's still pictures. I think now a good still, the way they take them is better than a, it's sometimes better than a mount, you know, but being able to relive it and memory, it's the memories you get from it year after year. And every time you look at it, I think so it's, you know, what's the best about all of them. Yeah, that, that's the craziest thing about, you know, whitetail hunting is that, or any, any hunting, it seems like no matter what happens in your life or what goes on, what you do, you can always look at that deer or, you know, that elk or mule deer or moose. It, it doesn't matter. And replay that hunt right there in your mind. Details. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, no doubt. Someone will say, why is that little buck mounted or do you have that doe mounted? And I never, you know, I never knock anybody because I remember the experience you had on your first couple of hunts and, you know, you just to look at them again, you relive that moment. I think that's priceless. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's something no, nobody will ever take away from you. And every deer, or everything you harvest, first one or not, it's a trophy, you know. And it felt good at the time. And, you know, that that's your harvest. Nobody can take that from you. Yeah, and I think we, I take pride in the fact that I think as a TV show, as a group, and I have nothing against, you know, guided hunts. I think it's great. There's a place for them for everybody. Not everybody has the time and with families and their work schedules, but I think we take pride in, you know, 99% of our stuff. We go out and we do what the average guy does, you know, at home. We're putting the truck camera out like he is. We're not walking into a, you know, we're not walking into, a, you know, an Iowa farm or a Texas ranch and that has, you know, a million big bucks on it and they're just walking up. We never saw it before and we're shooting it just to get footage. You know, that's, I never, I, you know, I'm not going to pass that up at times. I'm not going to lie, but the majority of our stuff is, you know, we're just like, well, I want to be the average guy, the average guy. We're no better. We're no different. I just think we take more time than maybe some people care to, to find the best spot, let the deer grow. That's what we enjoy. You know, I think we, that's what I think we enjoy most as a group and a TV show is like to do all turkey hunts, everything, you know, we like to do it like we would do it if we weren't with a camera. We're just doing it on our own. Right. You know, it brings it back to having fun and, and doing what you love. You know, I always said the day this isn't fun for me anymore. I'm not going to do it anymore. Yeah, absolutely. I can agree with that 100%. Jay, how about you? Absolutely. Just uh, have fun first. That's the name of the game. And then after that, um, make it your own, basically. Scott, when did you decide to turn your passion into a business? Um, I was 
when I was guiding in Montana, I was with, uh, I worked for an elk ranch that was just, it was a primitive area that was only archery or muzzleloader only. So I met some people there, like Bob Fulcrop came through and hunted with us, and Will Primos, and another gentleman who was there, who was Wilson Reynolds, who was doing a bunch of stuff on TNN, a show called Turkey Call, and stuff on Discovery, and take a photographer at National Geo. He called me because he would, you know, we stayed in touch and became friends. Like I said, in camps, you always make friends and people you stay in touch with, you know. And he out to me and said, I have all this camera equipment and a couple of young videographers. He said that, you know, that love, you know, love the film and they're more duck hunters than big game hunters. You know, you want to do this. You know, you do, you know, everybody in the industry, you put your time in all over the place. I'm sure you can find us some hunts and some quality hunts. He was kind of in the same boat. And we took these young videographers in, and now they're like my family to me, like brothers. And I always felt like I was asked before that to do stuff. And I never wanted some strange cameraman that I wasn't friends with to want me to shoot 110 inch deer, 120 inch deer, that I want to go home and be done filming. So I got, you know, we're very gun ho, patient, and we became friends. And, and uh, that's how it started. We started on NBC Sports, which was Versus. Did very well in there, had really good numbers out there, channel called on us. Um, we felt like with all the stuff that happened in Connecticut with that shooting, when they took us off the air, we just felt they weren't really one of us, the network. And we felt it was a good time to make a change and go to Outdoor Channel last year. Um, you know, and now we're here this year and I just love it. And I would never, it never, ever, ever seemed like work, um, until the cameraman asked me to do something for about the eighth time to <laughs> retake. <laughs> but, and it's you know when you're with people you enjoy to be around it never never ever seems like work it's always fun. Gotcha. How many re- how many retakes do you have to do? We don't do a lot. Um, not a lot of our stuff is reenacted. Um, usually we try to catch it real. If that doesn't happen, sometimes we'll try to relive it after the fact, like on a green screen. Um, you know, or talking on the screen rather than faking a faking the excitement. I sure. don't, don't think that's that you can that that comes through as. People can see through that. I never wanted to kind of be that. Sometimes we, you know, there's times you have to, but we try to stay away from that yeah. as much as possible. We do react a little bit on the bow and the cutaways on that because you don't have two cameras of the quality of the cameras we're using. Two cameramen to be able to do that and really capture it. But, but as far as the reactions and the talking pieces and everything, we try to do it as it happens. And if we don't do it as we happen, so let's run it like a really you know, we'll show misses, we'll show bad hits, and I insist on that, because I feel like, you, well, and I get bashed for it from time to time, you know, but I feel like that's real. Like, if that doesn't happen to you, you're not really a hunter. You don't really get it. If you do, you're not telling. Yeah. You know, that's part of our part of our sport. I appreciate that you do that, because it. I don't like to pretend like hunting is is something that it's not and there there are very there are many many imperfections in hunting um but that's what makes it kind of fun too is that is all that stuff that goes wrong um they try not to make go wrong but that that's just part of the game and if you the perfect example here's a perfect example i shot a deer in kansas that i hit the day before he was in a middle of a cornfield and i crawled for two hours on film and shot him in 104 yards and just hit him in the center of the body. And I could sit here and tell you I'd be the best shot. If the deer didn't drop a foot and move, I would have shot a foot under his belly. And I wouldn't have shot at that deer if I didn't shoot him the day before. But you'll look at it and say, and then I'll go back and I'll shoot a deer at 25 yards and shoot over his back or hit him bad. You know, and people will say, how can you shoot a deer at 100 and miss at 20? It's every, every opportunity, every situation, everyone's different. You know, you kept your composure, your heart's beating, you know, you're like everyone is different. And I feel like, you know, that's anybody who says that they're going to hit them perfect every time and never lost a deer, they haven't really hunted them much. They haven't really shot a lot of deer and that they're just literally just fleeing my mind, to be honest with you. But I just feel you have to, every, every single situation you're in, and even if a turkey, a deer, an elk moves the bear, everyone's going to come at you different. Right. You know, and how you react to it and how you do it is what makes us love it. I mean, if we didn't get pumped up or, you know, we made a perfect shot every time. I'm sure we would still love it. Maybe not as much, but you know the highs and lows, and that's what makes you. I think you know practice more, scout harder, hang a tree stand better. You know, do all that stuff to try to make yourself you know a master of your trade. What right. you love to do. Right. Um, let's go through some of the the folks that you've got on your team. Yeah, I have um we have a pro staff of around eight people. Okay. Um, which has been a huge help because now that and the hardest part was. You know, getting other people. Everybody's a good hunter. Everybody, you know, has a, can shoot a bow, can kill a deer. But finding somebody else that can actually run that camera and capture the footage that's good enough to be on the and the quality to be on the show always is the biggest hurdle. 
So Lonnie has been my main field producer since day one, who was just amazing with the camera um, to the point where he's grown to, part, to be a partner from his hard work and um, just dedication to just being a student, always trying to be a step ahead. Dave is another guy who's in the show, Dave Stracola. He started with us, has you know, been a huge help with his creative side with the camera, and he gets, does a great job in front of the camera. I have a team in Ohio, Gary and Seth, um, who have been a huge help. They are both, you know, Gary's hysterical, country singer, comedian, you know, and a really great friend of mine, the Good Hunter. Um, those two guys do a great job on my Ohio team. I have a team now in South Carolina that helps out with hogs. Uh, they're more of a family. They're a great family. They have kids, and I feel like they express that part of the side of the, the hunting for us. So we, then we have a, a girl named Melissa who's been with us since day one, and she's not someone who is kind of new at the sport and just enjoys being out there right. and doesn't try to act like she's the next, you know, Tiffany or, you know, the best woman hunter. She just likes being out there in the woods and appreciates being out there, and I think that's, you know, an important part that, you know, should come through on the TV. Um, so my guy, Chris, who's a local guy here in Jeremy, they're another team I have here in PA that, you know, are just, you know, the, the dedication it takes and the time it takes just to do all the other stuff for your sponsors, you know, video clips, all the stuff that they want besides just the hunts now is it's like a full-time job for everybody. And it takes dedication, time away from your family. And they all just do, you know, an amazing job of sacrificing that, you know, and really, really, truly caring about, you know, the business side, you know, and the hunting side and the filming side, you know, because I have a million friends that are great hunters, kill huge deer, but, you know, they don't want anybody to trade with them or, you know, they don't get shaky footage or they don't, you know, they don't, they don't get it. You know, and I think I have a group now that every year they just keep getting better and better and they see the footage that I'm getting with Lonnie and they want to try to surpass us or, or be as good. And I think that's what makes it, uh, makes it a good group. Right. That's awesome. Now, when did you decide to, I mean, you, you, you've got the company, but you decided to make the television show Primal Instinct. How did you come up with the name? Well, we felt like we were bow hunters and we can kind of do it ourselves. You know, we're not, you know, we're not, we're none of us are we're just blue collar people that love to hunt. And we felt the sport and the one-on-one challenge, the scouting, the food plots, everything, how we do it is, is primal. I mean, it's just, it's in our blood. We love it. You know, we just we eat, sleep. And my wife said it's 12 months a year. It is. It's every day. At some point you think about it. Um, we don't ever get away from it, whether I'm at work for someone to, also in the mortgage business, so I um, have another career, and at some point every day, it crosses your mind, I think, and that's what makes us, you know, that's the primal part of it. It's something that's pure, you know, gets me away from that rat race, you know, just getting that tree is, is, is a true joy, for sure. Right, gotcha. Um, so tell us about the TV show. When are, when are we watching this? What's the next episode coming up? Uh, this Friday night at 9.30, we're on the Outdoor Channel, okay. every Friday night at 9.30. We're also on at Monday nights at 5 p.m. Um, from now until the end of December. We'll have uh, seven new episodes. First one was last week. It was actually that Kentucky Youth Hunt with those kids we talked about a little ways back. Uh, this week I'm chasing a deer in Iowa with a non-resident tag. It took me a bunch of years to draw. And then we're just in Ohio and all, you know, Ohio and Eastern Shore of Maryland. And we're trying to do some stuff. We do some stuff in Pennsylvania and New Jersey where you don't see a whole lot of that on the Outdoor Channel. You know, people hunting on the East Coast, everybody's in Iowa, Kansas, Nebraska, you know, the, the Western stuff. And we're, sure. we're trying to, we're trying to do some more stuff in a, in a, you know, with high end video and, you know, cinematography and cool time lapses and nighttime time lapses and do some stuff that I think it's been done on the East Coast. But I think we're going to try to step it up and do it and, you know, take my dad back to the mountains this fall and take him on a rifle hunt and have it all captured, you know, with a, a ridiculously good videography. You know, I've seen it done with some terrible videography and people just don't get it. But back to that point where you can capture the emotion, you know, we're going to do some stuff at home here. I think more than, than ever, I think that's, we feel like, you know, you see the bone collector will come to Pennsylvania, New Jersey. It's one of their most watched episodes. And I think guys in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and New York, and those places would like to watch people hunt their own state, you know, instead of somewhere in the Midwest where they may never, ever, you know, be. I want to do that in Pennsylvania where I can have someone that's my age and did it with their dad and say, you know, maybe I need to do that again one more time. So, right, right. Well, that's very cool, Scott. Um, what what can we expect uh, coming up? Any anything? Any little tips or secrets that's coming up to, that that uh, we should be looking for? I don't think we're like I said. I think we're just like everybody out there. We just want to bring our experience 
to everybody, show the camaraderie of a lot of the stuff we do. We can't show on TV. You know, it's guys, guys being guys, getting on each other's cases and having a good time. But I think we just want to show that we're, you know, we're like you two guys in a hunting camp. We're like the guy listening on the radio that goes hunting with his three buddies after work, you know, on a Saturday when he gets swept away from his family for a couple of hours. That's who we are, and that's how we want to bring it. We don't want you to think we're any different than anybody else. So, what's want to feel like for the average guys that, you know, just have, we're no different than anybody else. We just happen to have a, I have a good cameraman behind me that makes me look good. <laughs> it's always good to have a good cameraman, isn't there? That's excellent. Yeah. He can only do so much. <laughs> yep. Scott, if you could give us just one hunting tip and only one hunting tip that is your best hunting tip for people listening, what would it be? Um, I think, think. I think the most important hunting tip I can give anybody is, is think before you make any move, before you get out of the car in the morning, before you get a shower. I think it's think about wake up in the morning and try to think, you're, how am I going to get to the tree? You know, how am I going to get in without getting caught? What should I wear? What's the wind doing today? I think strategically planning out your hunt, whether it's a duck hunt, a deer hunt, a moose hunt, elk hunt, I think strategically thinking it out before you do it and having a plan, I think is the most important key to success in my opinion. We're staring at a map, and I think that would make definitely can make you more successful. Not overthinking it, taking the fun out of it. Yeah. But I think just thinking, thinking, having a game plan, I could say, has probably made us more successful than anything else in the past. And I think that's our that would be my best tip. Awesome. I think that's a great that's a great tip. Awesome um, tip. Yep. Um, well, Scott, this has been fantastic, and thank you for sharing your life story and your business story and everything that's going on. And we'd love to have you back again on the show, maybe um, after uh, hunting season and see how you did and uh, go from there. No, I really appreciate you guys having me. It, was a, it never gets old uh, talking to hunters or telling a hunting story for sure. And I appreciate you guys having me on. It's been great. Uh, we appreciate it as well. Yep. Thanks again, Scott. Well, thank you to Scott for uh, sharing all his insights and telling us all about Game Changer TV and Primal Instinct, and uh, so if you're if you're going to go make a TV show, you know you might want to follow some of Scott's steps there. Um, he's kind of done it, and he's on TV, he's an Outdoor Channel, he's he's getting it done, NBC Sports. So, you know, if you're looking to do that, this is probably a good pattern to follow. So, uh, I think Scott's going to probably take it to some higher levels here, um, not too long from now. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it's all leading. You know, helpful things to get you in the season here. And, you know, look forward to some awesome, awesome podcasts coming up about yeah. some information that's going to help you hunt whitetails. Exactly. I mean, that's what we're all about. We're here to learn for ourselves, but to share as we learn the same knowledge that we gain as we talk to these great people that we have as guests on our show. Um, so, yeah, that was great. Nice. Thank you again to Scott. So, Dusty, what's going on over at Chubby Tines? You know, we just got our mineral out. We talked about it at the beginning of the show and, yep. you know, and did some lane trimming. And, you know, it's that time of year. If you, if you got tree stands out, it's time to get in there and start getting things set up for yourself. I agree. Um, you know, get your area set up. And, you know, I'm going to throw that out as my tip of the week. Get get in the woods now. Hold on. I got to say it. The Chubby Tines tip of the week. Okay, go ahead. Get in the woods. Get your stuff set up. You know, late August, early August, it don't matter. Get it set up. It's time, you know. Your season is just around the corner. Kentucky's coming up September sixth. Whoa! Yeah, you know, are you serious? That's yeah. Man. They're they're uh, they're able to smack a big velvet buck yeah. in September, early September buck bow hunting. That's awesome. I, I'm jealous, and I may have to make the journey down south and and do a little Kentucky velvet hunting. I, I'm trying, but you know, I, I'm a family man myself, and yep. the wife frowns upon that. Get one killed in Ohio first, and then you can go to Kentucky. Right. Oh, I want to hunt a velvet buck so bad I can taste it. Right. So we may have to get a buck killed in Kentucky and then hunt Ohio this year. I hear you. Yeah, you know, the families come first. That's the way it is, um, especially when you have you know, a wife and kids that, that want you there. So, you know. Yeah, she, she got she got one of the mood rings. Yeah. That thing's prettiest blue when she's happy. Yeah. But when she's pissed, it leaves the biggest red mark right on my forehead. That's weird how that happens. <laughs> that color change is crazy. <laughs> it's so crazy. Oh. It, it, it happens so <laughs> fast, too. Yeah. <laughs> It's, uh, it's, it's well, a crazy thing. Out. Yeah, you know, uh, I don't like to see the mood ring come out, but if it does, it usually leaves a red mark. <laughs> I think you'd learn by now to get the heck out of the room. <laughs> you know, it's why you're sleeping is the problem. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> that would be a problem when you're just starting to doze <laughs> off. A oh, whack. <laughs> nice. You can tell what kind of mood she's in right, right away. That's funny. It's, it's instant mood. 
instant mood identification. <laughs> oh man, that's fantastic. <laughs> uh, so, all right. Well, we've got some good yeah, stuff. Hey, good stuff yeah, coming I, up. Good. Something we haven't done, you know. I, I'm going to thank my wife. Yeah. For for allowing us to do the Big Buck Raise Your Big Buck podcast. You know, it, it, thank the fans, the the wives and the family. You know, and. I appreciate what my wife does for me. Oh, I, I appreciate what my wife does for me, too. She keeps my kids uh, kind of contained and quiet while we try to record the show because uh, I don't have a special studio necessarily. I don't have closed-in walls, but uh, they know that it's time to put on the show and that they've kind of come accustomed that uh, let's try to keep it quiet and my wife will monitor that. And if they're not quiet, they'll they'll move to the back piece of the house where we can't hear them so we can have a good recording. You know, and we take, what, about an hour a week where we, we get on the mic and we do need some quiet time. And I know you built a, your own podcast studio in your basement to that. So, I mean, we're, we're definitely dedicated to bring in good quality sound and good quality content to this show. And uh, I think it comes across. Oh, yeah, for sure. You know, we hope that everybody enjoys us and that, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to do the best that we can for our listeners and and uh, definitely give us some feedback and uh, give us a review on iTunes and let us know what you think of the show. Yeah, iTunes would be awesome. Uh, if you are an Apple user, that would be great. If you could go to iTunes, uh, bigbuckregistry.com forward slash iTunes, um, check us out there. Give us a five-star review. Listen to all the shows. I think we're, we're pushing in the well into the 60s now. Uh, as far as total shows, and you'll see a progression where we, when we first started, the sound wasn't quite as good as it is today. I and mean, we've really fixed that that problem we had with a squirrel chewing through your your cable line on your telephone pole, and that yeah. seemed to have fixed a lot of our sound problems. Absolutely, you know, and um, we're sounding great, and uh, you know, our, our listeners are definitely reporting that we're sounding better. And that, that's you know, we yes. wanted the best best quality that we can put out for our listeners, and we love what we do, Jay. And that 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 right there takes us to the next level yep. you know we're dedicated we're dedicated we, we enjoy it we love it we're hunting fanatics and, and our our guests are hunters too it, it don't get much better mm -hmm. i completely agree i love hunting i love talking about hunting i love talking to others about hunting i love having a podcast about hunting and i love getting on the mic every week with with you dusty and getting your insights because uh, you have a different perspective than i do and i learn things from you and i appreciate that yeah you know same with you jay and uh it just we work together well. Yes. Yep. And uh, it's uh, it's been an awesome, awesome experience. So let's keep it going for uh, indefinitely. Let's just keep talking because I'm thinking, Dusty, that we can be in our 90s and still talk on a microphone. You know, Jay, back in 2014, we was young whippersnappers. <laughs> that was excellent. <laughs> that's pretty much that, how it's going to be. Yeah, that, that's what the podcast will sound like when we're 90, you know. Right. I, I can't imagine there's going to be anybody who wants to listen to us at that point, but maybe we'll become, you know, uh, uh, the, the forefathers of the outdoor podcast industry along with us and Carrie Z and Mark Kenyon and, uh, you know, all those other great podcasters that, and there are very few of us doing outdoor podcasts, but wouldn't that be awesome if uh, we look back? Uh, 40 years from now and say hey i made that yeah we, we we're definitely headed in the right direction of being the you know to be retired podcasters in many years to come and yeah. say hey you know we we kind of got outdoor podcast on on the uh on the net yeah i think that'd be awesome the outdoor hunting podcast specifically there are a lot of outdoor podcasts but there's only a few outdoor hunting podcasts. You know, Corby Taylor, uh, the the guys from Ohio, the Hunt Fish Journal there near you. So I could probably count on two hands the number of outdoor hunting podcasts that exist. Yeah, right on. You know, and we're blessed to be in the beginning and the start of all the podcast mecca. Yeah, I do believe this is just the beginning as, as things develop and, and mature. I think this will be like the foundation of that whole thing. Hey, did you, did you see that buck mount that I put on Facebook today? I did. You know, that was probably one of the coolest buck mounts I've ever seen. I like, I loved it. It was, it was like, it was like the mega buck rotisserie. Yeah. A, a, a nice antler buck on a pedestal that rotates slowly. So you can see all dimensions of the rack. Just the best. It loved was very cool. Uh, yeah. I like to have that in my house. Yeah. Me too. Now I just need a nice buck to do that. <laughs> so it'll happen. It'll happen. I know. I'm gonna. I'll make it. I'll certainly put in the effort. There, there will be no question about my effort. Nobody's ever questioned my effort about deer hunting. That's for sure. Yeah, you, know, you work hard. It, it pays off. I agree. I agree. 
And you have to think about it, too. Hunting smart is as important as hunting often and hard. Yeah, absolutely. Jay, how can the people get with you at the Big Buck Registry? All right. Uh, Facebook is a great place if you want to submit a picture. Uh, you can go to actually www.bigbuckregistry.com forward slash my buck, or you can visit facebook.com forward slash big buck registry, twitter.com forward slash big buck registry, and call in a uh, to our phone line at 724 613 2825. Leave us some feedback about this show. And always, 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 please visit uh, vid, visit us on Stitcher or on iTunes and leave us a five-star review on iTunes, if you could, at BigBuckRegistry.com forward slash iTunes. Dusty, how can we get a hold of you over at Chubby Tines Outdoors? Facebook.com forward slash Chubby Tines Outdoors and check me out at Dusty Hunt Neck on Facebook. Very nice, man. Very nice. Well, thanks again to Scott Skiara for joining us from Game Changer TV and Primal Instinct. And uh, we'll... Uh, We'll see you next week, man. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we, we look forward to it. Thank you to the listeners. Yes, thank you to everybody tuning in to the Big Buck Registry Podcast. I'm Jay Scott. And I'm Dusty Phillips. This is the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. See you next week. Can't wait. Can't wait.